Welcome to the High Bandwidth Word Podcast, transformative studies in the Word of God. I'm Pastor John Harris, and this is my podcast. Our topic today is on the devil's devices. I bet you've thought about that. How does the devil work? How can he get a hold of you? Can he can he cause you to sin? Can he take you over? How's he working the lost? You know, the Bible has much to say about it. We're going to open up the Word and check it out. Join me over the next few weeks as we open up this study and find out what God's Word has to say about the devil. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And remember that. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against Satan and his army, his host, his angels. And that's the battle. And uh, I want you to just look at one word there in verse 12. It says, for we, what's the next word say? Wrestle. Wrestle is the idea of, is, is, is a very grueling sort of activity. Uh, it only goes on for six minutes in, say, high school wrestling or college wrestling. But it's six minutes and it's six hard minutes, nonstop. Uh, a grueling endeavor it requires endurance and it requires incredible stamina, requires strength. And that's why verse 10 says this. Go back up to verse 10. Finally, my brethren, what to say there? Be strong in the Lord and in what? The power of his might because see we don't have the endurance and we don't have the strength to wrestle this battle but God does and the Lord will through you and I if we allow him and so as we look at the sort of Satan's devices and what he's doing because we're not ignorant of his devices as we look at how he operates we need to understand that for us to stand we must stand in the power of his in his power and his strength and in his might okay this is the power Power is energy in action, God's energy in action, and might is His ability. It's not our ability, it's His ability. And so we remember that, and, and you can stand, because one of the devices that Satan uses for, against us is that we're weak, and we can't, and we're unable. And when we get hit, we get sometimes get pretty hit pretty hard, and we're down, okay, it's just like we can't get up. But God promises that, that the inner man, the, the, the new man is renewed, what? day by day, right? And the reason that new man's renewed day by day, that inner man's renewed day by day, is because you need that. <laughs> because each day is, is a battle. It's a battle. The other part of the one I want you to look at was in verse 11. It says, we, 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 that, oh, I'll start at the beginning. 6, 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the what? The wiles of the devil. Last time we were together, which seems like an eternity ago, because we just had the retreat, it was just last Wednesday, it just seems like a long time ago because I spent a lot of time talking. And um, it seems like a long time. But last week, I had to remind myself where we were at. And what we did, we looked at Satan's assault, his frontal assault, his, his, uh, how he attacks on an open stance. Uh, sometimes he comes at us openly. Okay, and you get hit hard. For instance, go to Acts chapter 13. I'll just briefly hit that real quick. I'm going to just uh, review for me, if not for you. Acts chapter 13, verse 41, you see a prescription, 41 through 50. There's sort of a prescription on how Satan attacks, and we'll skip a couple of verses and just go right down to verse 44. Um, it says, on a, and on the next Sabbath day, this is Acts 13, verse 44, there's Paul. It's the next Sabbath day he'd been in, he'd preached the gospel, the good news of what Christ did, the grace of God for salvation. And, and it says, and the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear what? The word of God, and as I said, the youth retreat. Do you think that they would like that? Do you think that Satan likes that, or his angels like the whole that the whole city would come together? What, talk about a tent meeting, right? You talk about a, a whole group coming together to hear the word of God. But verse forty-five says, "But when the Jews saw the multitudes, what they were filled with what envy, and it says there, and they 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 spake against the, those things which were spoken by Paul, and then you have the, the sort of the, how they how the operation occurs." contradicting and blaspheming. The initial response of, of, of the lost, the un unbelieving, those who don't know God, how Satan works through their spirit, because the spirit which worketh in them is the Satan spirit. His Ephesians chapter 2, the prince of the power of the air is the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. 
It's His Spirit that works in them. It motivates them, that strengthens them, that encourages them. And the one thing that they see, well, the, the, the one motivation that, that, that uh, Satan causes them to do is to envy. Okay, and we looked at that somewhat last time. Cause them to envy, to, to see something different. See, if you're standing up, and Paul was definitely standing up, and all these multitudes were coming to hear Paul, but you know what? The Jews were coming out of the synagogue. Were the multitudes coming to see them? No. So what? They, they were moved with what? Envy. Okay, and it seems to be the first response, the first mode, how, how Satan works in those that are lost is through envy. So if you're standing up, you're different, right? You're shining as a light. And if you're shining as a light and you're different, okay, the lost don't like that. It's, 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 it's different. And, and what Satan makes them perceive is somehow you are better than they. Or that you have something that they want. I mean, you have peace. And you have, uh, you have, you have something that's different. Well, they could either get it themselves, but typically the response is to take it from you, right? If you have peace, let's get rid of some of that peace. Let's go after you. And what they do is they begin to contradict. They begin to speak against and work against you and, 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 and attack in a variety of ways. And then they, if, if, if you're still standing, they blaspheme. They'll go contrary, exactly opposite what they know God is doing. They'll lie, they'll slander, they'll do anything. They know it's wrong. They'll go against their, even their conscience. And if that's not enough, as we said before, you go over to verse 50. If they can't do it by themselves, then they, they bring in others. In Acts 13, verse 50, what you do is you have them raising up others. Like the you know, battle cry time. But the Jews, what they do? They stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised what? Persecution. So they go out and they stir up others. So you know, if you get one of them, you know, Satan just get one. Just get one or two. You know, to envy. To perceive something different about you because he doesn't like the fact you're standing up on the battlefield you're out there sharing the gospel, you're out there preaching the word, you're out there teaching a Sunday school class, you're out there helping out in vacation Bible school, you're out passing out tracts. If you can get one person to stand up, that person can be used mightily to bring up a whole bunch against you. And then they can confuse things. Go over to Acts chapter, um, well, look, look at Acts 17 first, Acts 17 verse 5. You know, I mean, and, if the, and the chief men of the city and the, and the, and the, and the, you know, the, and the, uh, and the women, the, you know, the, 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 the main women in the city won't do it be enough. Then, okay, you don't go off the top ones. I'll go after some other ones. Acts 17, verse 15. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy. And then what did they do? Well, the, 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 higher, the hierarchies didn't work in the city. So, okay. Took unto them certain, what? Lewd fellows of the baser sort. And gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar. And assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out of the people. Go after the, you know, do whatever it takes. See, if you're standing on the battlefield of life, which that's what it is, or is a battlefield, you're in behind enemy lines, you're an ambassador for Christ, you're doing what God wants, then they'll come after you. Go over to Acts 19. Oh, it won't work. That was just a review of last time anyways. The other avenue, I can't think of what the passage is, but it's in Acts. And they use religion. And religion causes confusion. And, uh, oh, it's Acts chapter 13 also. Uh, there's a there's a there's a, uh, a whole confusion around around uh, around religion and bringing it against Paul. Wiles, those wiles. There's a couple different F methods. The first method is an assault. You know if you're getting attacked and a rock's getting thrown at you, right? Okay. Well, the second type of method is sort of a sneaky method. Okay, and it comes in a different avenue. And a lot of times you don't even know it's happening. It comes from it comes from different areas. And it's something that you have to be standing and you be prepared for. First, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And the thing is, this, hip, this, this type of activity hits you when you're standing. And you think you're standing. And you know what? And you think you're almost invincible. Okay? Because, you know, hey, I can handle this, the frontal assault. I can see that stuff happening. Okay? You can hit me. I know Satan's doing it. And I'm not worried about it. My Lord's standing with me. But in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12... 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, what? Take heed, lest he fall. However, notice this, verse 13. There hath no temptation, nothing that Satan brings against you, taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation, what? Also make a way to escape, that you may be able, may, that you may be able to bear it. 
What are we talking about? What, what, what are we talking about here? Well, look back at verse, uh, well, let's start at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, this is chapter 10, 1 Corinthians, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat. Notice what it says in verse 4. And did, and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was what? Christ. So the thing is Christ was there. I didn't know it in that, in that sense, but Christ was there. And notice what it says here. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, no, they're overthrown. Like they were taken out. Okay? Now these things were our examples. And yet that we should not lust after evil things as they what? Also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters. Why? As were some of them as is written that the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Because if you're an idolater, you're, you're involved in the world. You don't have any idea what's going on. Verse 8 says, Neither let us commit fornications as some of them committed and what? What's the next word? Fell. In one day, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were, what? Destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happen unto them for what? Examples. And they are written for what? Our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed, lest he fall. There's an issue that there's things that you can allow into your life or you, that, that, that are out there that they can take you off your feet and they can knock you down. And what God says also is that, listen, there's nothing that comes that you can't stand through because he's able to able to bear it up, okay? He, he won't allow anything in your life. In, 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 the, in the circumstance of life, God's sieve of love will not allow anything past that you can't bear up under his strength and his power. So let's take a look at some of what those things are. Um, Satan's wiles. There's two types. They go after your flesh, and they go after doctrine. They go after teachings. And you may think, well, you know, that'll never hit me. Maybe teachings one. You think, well, you know what? I'm pretty solid in the Word of God. Well, I can list you a bunch of individuals at this assembly over the last 30 years that I'm aware of that have been taken out. They were taken out by flesh, and they've been taken out by teachings. You can think of them too, I'm sure, if you spend enough time First, let's take a go to Colossians 2. By the way, the teachings, doctrine, has two parts. There is one part of the doctrine, which is legalism. Legalism takes some out. And the other part is sin that grace may abound. It's the other expanse. Uh, Pastor Ken just showed me a note from a guy uh, that uh, confronted him today and uh, named a few people. And basically, these people teach, you know, it's okay to sin. God's taken care of it. It's paid for. You know, the more you sin, the more God's grace is demonstrated. Okay, well, that's, that's a blasphemous document, or doctrine, and it's something that is taught in the Word of God as being something you should avoid. In fact, it's a, it's a, a temptation. Colossians 2. Let's look at a couple of these. First, the idea of legalism. And uh, this idea, of what I mean by legalism, is something that you need to do in addition to what Christ has done. To make, uh, either to make life fulfilling, to make uh, your uh, salvation secure, whatever it might be. We'll go down through, we'll see a whole bunch of these, and God calls them, He calls them things that Satan do, does. Take a look here. Colossians 2, verse 18. Look at our verse first. Let no man, what? Beguile you. Now, when you read that, let no man beguile you, the battle is not with the man. You understand? It's, it's not flesh and blood. Somebody behind that man is trying to beguile you, to trick you, to, to subtle you into something. He says, let no man beguile you of your what? Is it your salvation? No, it's not your salvation, your reward. About what God has in store for you in the future. In order to have your reward removed, taken from you, what you need to do is you need to quit, you, quit, you need to quit fighting. You need to fall down and be out of the battle. Okay? Paul says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, because of this, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but also unto them, all them also who love his appearing, I think is what it says. Colossians 2, verse 18, continue there. Let no man beguile you of your reward. Take you out of the battle by a trick in a voluntary humility and worshiping of what? 
angels. What? Worshiping and humbling yourself before angels. It says, it says, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up with his fleshly mind, and not holding the head, not focusing on Christ. As, as chapter 3, verse 1 says, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Colossians 3, verse 2 says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. The Colossians had taken their eyes off Christ and started looking at other things. They were looking at, in this case, uh, angels, okay? Uh, and in particular, not God's angels, okay? As we looked at uh, a couple weeks ago, we're talking about fallen angels. You know, but you might want to, you could throw in here things like psychics and astrology and curious arts and a variety of things like this. Go up to chapter uh, 2, verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. Colossians 2, verse 8. They're puffed up by their, by their fleshly mind. They voluntarily... And in so doing, take themselves out. They are tricked. They're saying, well, it's okay. A lot of people places out there looking to have some guardian angel protect them, right? Uh, you know, I have a guardian angel. Or they're praying to angels, okay? Touched by an angel. Keep those angels away from me. Like, I don't want touched by any of them, okay? Because they're not the ones that the Lord's sending down here for me. Colossians 2, verse 8. Beware. Be cautious. Lest any man spoil you. What's it mean to spoil? It's a military term. It doesn't mean to rot. It means to take from you that which you have. They come in. They, they ravish your house. They take all your possessions. They've spoiled you. They've taken it. Well, let no man... Bes let, let, beware lest any man spoil you through what? Philosophy. And vain, empty, deceit, deception. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Well, what are the rudiments of the world? What are rudiments of the world? Go over to uh, Colossians 2. Still in Colossians 2. Go to verse 30. Or 20, I'm sorry. There is no 30. Colossians 2, 20. I need to put my glasses on, I guess. Where, wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the what? Okay. If ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world. I mean, it says... Christ, you are dead with Christ, and so you're no longer part of the rudiments of the world. Because see over in Colossians 2, verse 14, Colossians 2, verse 14, saying, blotting out of the handwriting of what? Ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And he has spoiled principalities and powers because of that. But Christ has nailed something to the cross, ordinances. Look what it says again back in Colossians 2, 20. It says, wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why is though living in the world are ye subject to what? Ordinance. You are dead to the law is what it's saying. You're dead to those sort of, what's the next verse say? Touch not, taste not, handle not. Okay? Things that say, you know, rules and regulations of what it takes to be a Christian or to be a saint. You're dead to those things. Okay? The, the, the law does not make you closer to God. Legalism does not make you closer to God. And the Colossians were looking for something like that. It says, you know, there's, you know, there's some good, by the way, verse 23 says, there's some good stuff there. Which things have indeed a show of wisdom. I mean, there's some things you shouldn't touch and there's some things you shouldn't taste and there's some things you shouldn't do. But they don't somehow give you a better relationship, some greater fullness with God. That's why it says in verse 9, of Colossians 2. For in him, Christ, dwelleth all the fullness, what? Of the Godhead bodily. Everything's in Christ. It's not in how, you know, the legalistic activities, okay? Legalism, the, the idea of, of the law and, and, and somehow some standard that makes things, that, that, that somehow this is a better, this is what a Christian looks like, or a saint looks like. Rudiments of the world. It's vain deceit. It'll spoil you. Uh, get a very critical spirit. All of a sudden, you're better than somebody else because you don't do something. A lie. Colossians, go to Colossians 1. See, the things that you're concerned about losing, and the, Paul is very specifically talking to Colossians about this, uh, this issue. They were not centering their things on Christ and they're looking at other things. They're looking at, well, you know, angels, good relationship with angels or, or, or with traditions of men and things like that. Colossians 1, verse 26. It says, even the mystery... Colossians 1.26 Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints 
to whom God would make known what is the what? The riches of the glory of this mystery among the what? Gentiles, which is what? Christ in you. And that's it. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not Christ and baptism. Not Christ and circumcision. Not Christ and, and uh, uh, a vision. Not Christ in some miracle. Not Christ in some healing. It's not some, nothing else. Not Christ in some dream. It's Christ and Christ alone. Those who look for the and the get taken out because they quit looking at Christ and they start looking at the the, whatever it is, for the power. And the power is not there. It says in the last days that they'll have, they'll have a form of righteousness, but they deny the power thereof. And it has to do with not on Christ. Satan will take your eyes off of it. That's, it's a subtle attack. It doesn't seem like a big deal. You know what? We should be the best we can be. But it ought not be a standard that, that keeps people from, from growing spiritually. Go over to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. It's like looking for something other than Christ to be made complete. I guess that's what sort of... And Satan wants to take you that direction. Okay? And he'll do it with envy. I mean, uh, for instance, uh, who put you in the body? Who put you in the body of Christ? Who gave you your gifts? Christ, right? Well, how many of us look at others and say, like, well, I can't do that, or, I mean, or, or maybe, I, if I was that, I'd be, I'd be happier. Okay, they look at others and say, I'd rather be this or rather be that, instead of who they are. Or, or, they, or they'll say, like, well, since I'm not such and such, for instance, I'm not a foot, Okay, or I'm not a hand, or I'm not an eye. That's what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians. It shuts them down. I, you know, I, I want to be something other than I am. Well, God has made you complete, and he's put you in the body where you are. Don't believe the lie. Don't believe the vain deceit, because it'll take you out of the battle. Ephesians 4, verse 14. Ephesians 4, verse 14. That we henceforth be no more, what? Children, tossed to and fro and carried about by what? Every wind of doctrine, everything that blows through the door, by the slight of men, people just come along and sort of like a magician. You know, it sounds good, sounds nice, you know. Uh, perhaps, you know, Paul talks about a f few of these uh, types of ideas, you know, that gain is godliness, supposing that gain is godliness. You know what? If, you know, if God was blessing this church, what should happen? We should have gold doors out front, Right? We, that's right. We should have, you know, right? There should be 10,000 people in here. Oh, that'd be bad. We need a better air conditioning if we did that, okay? I mean, is that what it is? We should, we, should, we, should have offering, we should have bigger offering plates because we can't hold what's coming in. Does that mean God's blessing? See, that's subtle. Something else. Something else to see God. It's a, it's a subtle thing. A wind of doctors, sight of men. It says, and cunning craftiness, verse 14 again, Whereby they lie in wait to what? To deceive. And that's the reason why, verse 11, God gave some things. And God gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. For the perfecting of the saints. For the, for the maturing of the saints. For the bringing to the place where they need to be. So that they might do the work of the ministry. For the edifying the body of Christ. They all come together. It says, until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children. You know, pay, basically says pay attention. Listen, grow up. It's a dangerous thing to stay a child. How would you like to let your kid go if you have children, young children, or even if you don't have young children, at one time in your life, if you have had children, just at about the age of six, just put them on the street and let them go. How dangerous would it be just to send your kid out the door at six years of age? Well, some of us are quite willing to stay six. And not, a lot, a lot of, lot of, not allowing the Word of God to change us and, and to transform us to be who God says we are. Because when we're young, we can be tossed to and fro. The adversary can just come up and pick that kid and take him. Show up in a van and throw your kid in the back and take off. They lie in wait to deceive. Go over to Second Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Doc, well, before you go there, go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 
See, all these things, all these things are, are, are teachings, doctrines. You know, they come in with a slight of men and with the winds of doctrine. Okay, where are they coming from? First Timothy chapter 4, not from men. First Timothy 4 verse 1. Now the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly, this is directly and to the point, that in the latter times, what? Some shall depart from the faith. What? How? Some shall depart from the faith, giving what? Heed to seducing spirits, and what? Doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wise fables, and exercise thou, thyself rather unto godliness. Says, good doctrine. Good doctrine. Not the doctrine of seducing spirits. Throwing in things like forbidding things and abstaining from things. Yeah, you know. You know, different choices and different things. Legalism. Go over to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. And you might as well get Galatians 1 while you're at it. Galatians 1. 2 Corinthians 11. And Galatians 1. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3. And Galatians 1. But I fear. Here's Paul's fear. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent, what? Beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your minds should be what? Corrupted from the simplicity that is in what? Christ. You know, it is, you know what? The Christian experience, being a saint, is a very simple task. Stop you doing. Let everything be in Christ. Your salvation is in what? Christ. Your security is in Christ, right? Christ is in you. Your life is to be in Christ. Everything you do should be to Christ, right? It's very simple. It's not something else. It's Christ and Christ alone. If it says, verse 4 says, for, he, for if he that cometh, this is 2 Corinthians 11, I did say 2 Corinthians 11, right? 2 Corinthians 11 is verse 4. For he, if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which we have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. That is, you might be carried away with it. You might be carried away if you receive another Jesus. Not the one that the Bible talks about, what, what Paul talked about. Or another spirit. Let's talk, not talk about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about angels and fallen angels and things like that. Or, a, or another gospel. You know, somehow if there is none, right? What's, what's Galatians 1 say? Galatians 1. Verse 6. Paul says in Galatians, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him, who's him? Christ, that called you into the grace of Christ unto what? They slipped off after some other gospel. But it's not another gospel, it's not another, it says. But there be some that what? Trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, Paul says, but though we... Or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. It says, as we said before, so say I again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Let him be apart from all everything. It says there, did you notice it says in verse 8, whether it comes from a man or from a, an angel? It's not a flesh and blood. I mean, God's angels aren't going to preach another gospel, right? They're not. Talking about Satan's angels. Well, do they come after you with a with some some experience? Well, look, or go to you're right there, right beside Second Corinthians. Go back to Second Corinthians eleven again. Look at verse thirteen. Second Corinthians eleven, verse thirteen. For such are false apostles. Second Corinthians eleven thirteen. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers. And look what happens. They transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. It says, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of what? Righteousness. 
They preach righteousness. Okay? Pastor Culp used to say that was, that was the way. It's not the, it's not all the stuff. Satan doesn't want to self-worship and stuff like that, but he, he wants to be, he wants to be worshiped as God. He's a minister of righteousness, and his, his followers are ministers of righteousness. It says, whose end shall be according to their works. They're gonna receive what they get. But ministers of righteousness, that is, live a righteous life. What's it take to get to heaven? What's it take to get to heaven? Don't you have a little good life? Exercise our faith. We need to have our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I've been, uh, you go, go witness to people sometimes and somebody will say, well, I'm not as bad as my neighbor. Well, you know, that's, a, that's, that's a, he's heard as ministers of righteousness to say, well, you know, if you live a good life, that'll get you close to God. Well, living a good life won't get you to heaven. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14 that there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. And the way, there is only one way, it's through Christ. And, it's, and ministers of righteousness preach something else. They come out there and they say, hey, do this, do this, do this. You know, and maybe God will accept you. But the issue is something Christ did. Jesus Christ paid for our sins with burying and rose again that we might have new life in Him. I guess we'll end there tonight because the next thing I want to talk to you about is the other side of things. Okay, uh, If you want to read it, you read Ephesians 5, chapter verse 3 through 12. And you see, it's the other end of things. That is, it's okay to sin. That's the other deceit. Satan will use that one on you. And I've heard people say to me, my sins are taken care of. I don't have to worry. As a justification for their life. But that's not... Yeah, they're, they're on their way to heaven. But see, they're on a trap. They're ens- ensnared. If that's something that... And Satan will make you help you believe that. If you wish. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time together. We thank you, Lord, for your word. You've been listening to the High Bandwidth Word Podcast, Transformer Studies in the Word of God. I hope you've enjoyed the study. Please subscribe, like, and comment. This podcast is available on many podcast platforms. Just search on the title. Now, until next time, fight the good fight of faith, and God's best to you.